the Radio Shack Colour Computer was a line of home computers introduced by the Tandy Corporation in 1980. It was one of the first colour home computers marketed as an affordable alternative to the Apple II and the Commodore VIC-20. Affectionately called the Coco, it was a popular platform for a variety of games, applications and expansion opportunities. As we can see, this case has had a hard life. So let's see what we can do. Lifting the lid of this Coco, we can see we have a 53 key keyboard, the motherboard in the middle, the power supply on the left hand side with a thin protective cardboard covering. At the back of the motherboard we can see the RF modulator and that this computer is working. To get to the case, we need to remove the keyboard, the power supply and the motherboard. So as a recap, let's see how this computer is architected. So we have the main processor, the graphics function, the synchronous address multiplexer, which allows all the components to talk to each other the peripheral interface adapters which enables connectivity to the cassette rs232 and joystick interfaces the keyboard and the cartridge connector the basic roms dynamic ram and the rf modulator so let's locate these on the motherboard so first off, we found the 8-bit processor running at 2 MHz, followed by the video display generator, the synchronous address multiplexer, the peripheral interface adapters, the base and extended Microsoft Color Basic ROMs, which we can check using an exec command. 1 bit 16k RAM and the RF or radio frequency modulator. Moving our attention back to restoring the case, we need to remove that permanent power cable. Having been careful to leave enough room on the cable to keep the original fittings, Unfortunately, we now need to address this beautiful Radio Shack Color Computer original label. Despite how painful this is to remove, it needs to be done to get us to where we need to be. Having sanded down both the top and the base units, I managed to remove most of the scratches and indentations. Whilst maintaining the spirit of the grey colour, I've gone for a slightly lighter slate grey. So now it's time to prime the case to identify any of those scratches or indentations I've missed first time round. Using this quicksand, to fill the areas I'd missed, I sanded the cases down yet again until they were smooth and gave them a couple of final coats. And now it looks like this. So putting the feet back on to the base of the unit and making sure the base is stable it's time to put the model and QC pass labels back on the base 
of the computer. Having checked the power supply unit over for any capacitors, breakage, leakage, splits or otherwise, to be honest with you, there's not much that could go wrong and actually looks pretty good. So I'm happy to leave that where it is. Thin cardboard covering and all. Given my distaste for permanent power cables or otherwise, I'm looking for some solutions and found these kettle adapters which should do the perfect job. In addition to the segregated power cable, I'd also like to bypass the RF modulator to use composite video and separate sound via some RCA connectors. So looking for an earth point on the motherboard, I've thread through the female RCA connectors for composite video and sound under the motherboard I found a gap in the corner next to the cartridge to offer up to the RF modulator input one and three. Having secured the motherboard to the base unit, it was time to redirect the composite video and sound via the AV cabling, whilst ensuring the new joints remained strong with lots of hot glue. This composite video test has proven this mod is a success. So it's time to close the lid on the RF modulator and use the external kettle adapter for power and RCA connectors for a composite video and sound. Having purchased a replacement reproduction Radio Shack TRS-80 colour computer label, it was now time to complete this restoration. As the rear label descriptors were printed onto the back of the case, I opted for another retro labelling solution. Of the two Radio Shack joysticks I have, one of them is missing the button and the joystick stem. So a quick check on Thingiverse has shown somebody's already uploaded the print file for the fire button. Unfortunately, there was no file for the joystick stem, so using FreeCAD, I designed and uploaded my own, 3D printed them out, and assembled them onto the joystick. During our assessment of the motherboard, we identified this TRS-80 had 16K and was running Microsoft's extended Color Basic version 1.1. So having typed print mem to check available memory, we've only got around 8K. 
this is because the extended color basic ROM assigns 200 bytes to provide initialization for printers and keyboard devices. Using the clear zero command, we can allocate these 200 bytes back into available memory. In addition, we can release four pages of graphical memory, reallocate the beginning of basic and disk drive routines, which releases just over 14K, which we can now use to play some games.
next time on Retro Relics, we're going to explore cartridges from the past to the present. Thank mm -hmm. you.